I think a common theme of this talk will be that it's not possible to recover a species um, by just a small, uh, a small amount of effort. It takes a village to save a species. It takes a large collaborative effort. So just really want to acknowledge all of our, our partners and supporters up front. So the theme of this talk is going to be how we got to this point. So this was in June. One of the cats that we, um, we released um, as part of the Saving Wildcats project. It's one of the first cats to be released into the wild um, in Scotland. A really exciting moment. And myself and my colleagues, David Barclay and Kerry, are going to tell, uh, Dr. Kerry Langridge, are going to tell you really how we got to this point, um, which was a real milestone for the project. Um, and we'll get, first of all, really, just to go through a little bit about the status of wildcats. So they're the last remaining wild living felid. Um, they're classed as critically endangered. And there's a whole load of threats for this species. Hybridization with domestic cat is a big threat currently, but also persecution threat remains very high. And across the UK, there's a, about 150 individuals in the captive breeding program, which means it's part of an essential tool for conservation. And during this talk, we're just going to cover a little bit of a timeline, really, how we got from wildcats arriving in the UK around 9,000 years ago um, through to the current um, release project that we're doing today and the various conservation projects that have fed into that. So as I mentioned, um, the European wildcat came to Britain after the last ice age about eight to 9,000 years ago. It's a subpopulation of the European wildcat um, and in terms of um, the project, um, wildcat ecology is extremely important, obviously, in terms of the success of the release. And so um, it's important to note that wildcats, um, they're a small to medium sized carnivore. Um, they are habitat generalists and um, they require a mixed um, grassland and woodland habitat. Um, and really, it's really important that the habitat provides a combination of cover um, for denning, but also provision of the prey. Um, for the species, which is small mammals and rabbits. And I'm sure uh, Kerry will cover a bit more of that um, in her talk. Um, and in terms of the timeline for the UK, um, the historical threats to this species are hunting for sports and fur and persecution as, ver as vermin and also habitat loss. And by the 1800s, they were extinct uh, from England and Wales. Um, and by the 1850s, wildcat had become locally extinct in, in northern Scotland. And really, by 1915, the population had reached a low point. There was some expansion after World War I, partly because of depopulation uh, during, of human population during that time. Um, and that led to reduced per persecution and then reforestation and, and, and an increase in rabbits. And so by the middle of the 20th century, the, there was a recent population peak. But then again, in the 60s and 70s, um, there was another decline threat as, as threats began to reestablish, particularly around um, persecution technology um, and, and loss of rabbit populations. Um, and the it wasn't legal protection um, for the species until uh, 1988. Um, and it's important to note that hybrids um, aren't protected. Um, as you mentioned, wildcats hybridize with domestic cat. This is a species um, that comes from the Near East. It's about a million years uh, separated in evolutionary history and it's domesticated. Um, but the two species um, interbreed um, and the offspring are viable. Um, and hybrids can therefore breed with either parent species, so either with um, domestic cat um, or wild cat. And there's a number of different ways that we, we use to determine hybridization. Uh, one of the really important methods is, is something called pelage scoring, looking at the difference in the appearance of the cat. So um, both the wild type for the domestic cat and wild cats are a tabby species. So that means they're brown and black stripy, brown or gray and black stripy. Um, but there's a number of different um, uh, traits on their on their coats that differentiate the two species. Um, and that's a, that's a method that's used for distinguishing um, wildcats, um, uh, particularly in the wild and in the field. So apart from using the pelage research, um, genetic research has also really helped to understand hybridization um, and really understand what's going on underneath that. Um, and genetic research has shown that hybridization has really escalated um, between the two species from the 1960s onwards, and that the population in Scotland is a continuum or a hybrid, sc hybrid swarm.
really um, from around the 1990s onwards, people became concerned about the fate of Wildcat. This was a time when people did um, started to think about doing research on the species, habitat use, diets, genetics, and pelage. Um, and that, that research search led to um, a real concern about what was going on. And the first targeted conservation action project, which actually happened here in the Cairngorms, it was the Cairngorms Wildcat Project or Highland Tiger Project that happened from 2010 to 2013. Um, and that project gave rise to the Scottish Wildcat Conservation Action Plan, which was the first national conservation plan for the recovery of wildcat and brought together a whole number of different organisations. Um, and that plan ran from 2015 to 2020. Um, and that work was focused very much on trying to preserve the remaining wildcat populations within Scotland and to halt the decline within five years. Um, there were a number of uh, sites that were chosen to be um, wildcat priority areas. Um, and that's really where um, in situ action was targeted, um, monitoring what was going on in those populations and also conducting trap neuter vaccinate release um, to re re reduce the amount of um, feral um, domestic cats that were causing a threat in terms of hybridization. And in parallel, um, the captive population uh, was, uh, in management of the captive population was improved as a potential tool for future recovery. Um, but partway through that project, um, the partners became very concerned that some of the assumptions that went into uh, kind of devising the Scottish Wildcat Action Project maybe weren't quite right, particularly that there were more wildcats out there um, than was actually the case. So as people, as the field teams in that project, um, and they did a fantastic work of, of going out and gathering an enormous amount of data um, on the ground um, about the, the, the cat populations in those areas, as they went out and looked at that, it became very clear that in fact, um, a large number of the cats um, that were out there were, were um, hybrid or feral, feral cats or, or feral domestic cats or hybrid individuals. Um, and so we invited in um, the IUCN uh, Species Survival Commission Cat Specialist Group in 2019 to conduct an independent review of everything to do with wildcat conservation in Scotland. Um, and they came in and they conducted that study and they concluded that the population was no longer viable. Um, and that really meant that um, even if there were individuals still living in the wild, um, they were unable to form a self-sustaining population. So effectively, that there were just too few uh, wildcats, or they were too, and they were too widely dispersed and too hybridized um, to recover without outside help. Um, and basically, that without urgent action, um, wildcats would be lost forever from Britain. And that's really then the basis for um, thinking about the release project. So. Our vision really with saving wildcats was to restore um, wildcats back to landscapes across Scotland. Um, and it's a European partnership project uh, dedicated to Scottish wildcat conservation and recovery. And we're aiming to do that uh, to prevent the extinction of wildcats to Scotland by breeding and releasing them into the wild. And that's what Saving Wildcats um, is currently doing. And the project um, is one of two halves. Um, a preparatory phase um, and the release phase. Um, and as of June this year, we're now in the release phase. Um, but the preparatory phase has two separate sections to it. Um, the first section is um, around really understanding everything to do with the release site and preparing the release site um, for the wild. And you're going to hear in a moment from uh, Dr. Kerry Langridge uh, more about that. Um, and the other, the other phase is the conservation breeding, um, making sure that we have a captive population um, that's suitable for release. Um, and uh, David is going to now tell you about that. Okay, thanks, Helen. And um, if you just bear with me, everybody, I'm just going to load up uh, my presentation. And just to pre-warn you all, there are some very nice videos in here, but uh, given the technology glitches, hopefully, they work okay, but keep your fingers crossed. Okay, hopefully this is um, coming through okay. Um, and thanks for the, the introduction, Helen. Um, as Helen mentioned at the start, my name is David Barclay and I'm the ex situ Conservation Manager for the Saving Wildcats uh, project. Um, in addition to that, I also manage the Captive Breeding Programme for Wildcats in the UK. 
and have done for the last eight years. Um, and in this presentation, it will just really give you a, a, an insight and overview to the work that we do behind the scenes um, here at the, um, the, the project headquarters at the Highland Wildlife Park and how the decisions we, we make with population management and the work that we do in the breeding programme has helped us get where we are today with the, the Saving Wild Cats Recovery Project. Now, some of you will, will, will be aware of um, the, the role of zoos in, in general, but maybe not specifically with regards to a recovery project like this um, for Wildcats. So I'm just going to start by giving you an introduction as to the work that we, that we do in zoos, the work and role of the, the, the breeding program and how that's been influencing our decisions um, moving forward. Um, as I mentioned, we've um, managed the captive population of wildcats in the UK um, since 2015. And without going into too much detail, um, it basically functions as a long-term insurance policy, or at least it should function as a long-term insurance policy. And if that management um, is done well, and it does function as, as the insurance policy, then it can play a role as a very valuable conservation tool um, to add to the other work uh, that we do with trying to save a species like the wildcat. And as part of the work that we do in, in population management, um, we develop strategies so that we can uh, show how the captive population can contribute to the conservation of the species. We can develop um, best practice guidance. We can develop um, long-term management plans uh, and what we call population viability analysis, which allows us to look at the captive population and run a whole bunch of models and projections to see if A, that population is strong enough for, for us to remove animals so we can breed from them and release them into the wild and to make sure that into the future, we're not going to harm that population in doing so. So just on the right, you'll, you'll be able to see the development we've had with the captive population since we took it over in, in 2015, where the population in zoos in the UK was about 65, and now the population is up over 150 individuals. And obviously that gives greater strength, greater genetic diversity, and it means that it's a more robust population and, and can support us better for uh, a recovery project. And as Helen touched on in her presentation, the wildcats that we have here in Scotland are, are a subpopulation of those found in Europe. And unfortunately, there's unlikely to be um, any or many wildcats left in Scotland. Um, so the ability for us to add new genes from any wild animals into the captive population is, is very slim. Um, so if we don't want that population to remain as a stagnant pond, which essentially is at the moment, we have to look at other options to be able to add genes and improve the viability um, and sustainability of that option, uh, population. So moving forward, we will be looking at strategies as to how we can maybe add some animals from Europe to give um, more viability in the long term for, for our captive population and the population that we're breeding for release. And as you'll see in the strategy on the top right, we have selected animals from the captive population moved them into our dedicated captive breeding center where we're then breeding animals um, and releasing them into the wild. And as part of that, um, as I mentioned, we, we develop a best practice guidance so that we, um, we can document the work that we're doing, other projects can learn from us, and that we're always applying an adaptive management approach. And we, as the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, the lead partner of Saving Wildcats, we're a member of the British, uh, British Association of Zoos and also the European Association of Zoos. And it's actually with um, the European Association, we do a lot of our work and we've developed a lot of really important documents um, and plans where we can um, look forward to a, a, a long-term sustainable uh, plan for the wildcat management. And as I mentioned there, we actually have a very important tool um, here at the, the Highland Wildlife Park, which is a new conservation breeding for release center, which we built um, a couple of years ago at the start of the project. And really that's given us all the right resources where we can remove some animals from the captive population. We can house them in um, remote, quiet, offshore enclosures. 
um, and then we can breed from those animals and prepare animals away from disturbances, away from uh, the general public and, and natural areas prior to releasing them into the wild. And the reason that we have gone down the road of developing a, a conservation breeding centres, we actually see that in other projects across the world that have had to um, captively breed animals and then release them into the wild. And when you look at other projects, for example, the Iberian lynx, uh, black fooded ferret or European mink, you see a common denominator, which is there being a dedicated conservation facility. So we wanted to apply that same approach to the work that we are doing with wildcats. And as you can see, we have um, uh, quite a range of facilities on offer. In, in addition to the, uh, the management headquarters where I am just now, we have a large um, eight acre breeding center at the back of the park where we have a mixture of breeding enclosures, pre-release enclosures, uh, a high level of biosecurity, and then also an extensive CCTV monitoring system. So this image that you'll see and the cat that you see, um, uh, you'll, you'll quickly recognize is, is not a wild cat and doesn't look as though it's in Scotland. This is actually a, an image of one of the Iberian lynx breeding centers um, in Portugal. Um, and then there's three more centers in Spain. And as Helen touched on, the Iberian lynx project is regarded as, as one of the most successful carnival recovery projects to have ever taken place. And we've we've had the privilege to be able to partner um, with Junta de Andalucía, who have led on the Iberian Lynx recovery project. So we've learned a huge amount from the work that we've done, and that's informed us um, not just in the way that we manage um, our wildcats, but also the way that we've designed our conservation breeding for release center. So you'll see some similarities between that image and this image, um, which is our center. Um, based here at a, a very quiet area of the Highland Wildlife Park. Um, and the reason that it's offshore to the public where nobody can go and we have very um, strict access and strict biosecurity is that we don't want the cats to become accustomed to human disturbance or human noise or a uh, human presence in any way. So we have this area sort of locked away from, from any people, any vehicles, any disturbance, and we only have a, a very small expert team that manage the wildcats on a daily basis. But in this image, you can see um, a, a fence that goes around the whole center. That's our biosecurity fence to make sure that no unwanted guests or other local carnivores um, can get into the center or up close to the wildcats. We have a changing area in the bottom left where our, our staff change their clothing, change their footwear before they go into the center to make sure that we don't accidentally take in any um, disease or parasites to the cats. Um, the, the keepers also have a, a, a workspace in there. And then the enclosures um, that you see on the left-hand side are our breeding enclosures um, where we breed our cats. And then we have much larger pre-release enclosures, as you can see here. Um, and this is the, the final enclosure where we manage our wild cats prior to uh, releasing them into the wild. Um, so we've, we've tried to inform um, our decision making from lots of other projects that we, we've um, collaborated with and spoken to um, internationally and apply all those different techniques to, to what we need for wildcats and feel that we have um, a fantastic center uh, to be able to manage a, a species like the wildcat. So just a few other tools that I've, I've touched on already that um, make up our, our, our center. Um, we have our, our cute little um, buggy on the left-hand side, and you may be wondering why I'm showing you a picture of a, a little buggy. Um, but this is our, our little electric buggy, and one of the biggest risks for carnivores after um, release into the wild is actually road mortality. Um, and one of the objectives we have with managing the cats prior to release is to try and reduce, the, reduce as many of the risks as possible. Um, and it, it it may be very difficult to assess as to whether there'll, there'll be any impact, but we felt that it would not be advantageous to be driving petrol or diesel vehicles that make a lot of noise up the, the cats when we have to service and feed them. Um, instead, we thought it would be better for it to be an electric vehicle to reduce any risk of association between the noise of a vehicle and the food arriving. So that's why I am showing you our cute little um, electric buggy there. Now, another 
really important image is that on the top left. And this is um, a room that we have off to the side of our open plan office and our headquarters. And this is where um, we have our CCTV control room. Uh, we're very lucky to have installed um, 72 CCTV cameras right across our breeding centre, both in the breeding enclosures and in the pre-release enclosures, um, where we can sit down in the comfort of our office and do all the observations of the cats without going out there, without disturbing them. Um, and that allows us to, to evidence um, our work and monitor the behaviours, which is a, a really incredible tool to have. Now, in addition to our uh, facility, our, our breeding centre here at the Highland Wildlife Park, one of our partners, Norden's Ark, which is a, a conservation zoo in Sweden, um, has also built two dedicated wildcat breeding enclosures in their native species uh, conservation breeding centre. And you may be wondering why would they do that? Um, well, we've worked with Norden's Ark for a, a long time in conservation projects. We have a fantastic relationship, but one of our objectives is to try and bring in some cats from Europe to help us increase the gene pool and give greater viability to our population here in Scotland. And it can be quite complicated bringing cats directly in um, from Europe, especially if those cats are coming or, or have just come from the wild. So what we will be doing is actually moving any cats from Europe over into the breeding centre at Norden's Ark in Sweden, where they will then breed from those animals and then send us the offspring that we can then incorporate into our population. And that streamlines uh, the process, makes it less um, demanding on the animal, but makes it um, a quicker process as well, which uh, we feel um, gives us the best of both worlds. So just uh, moving away from the design of the facility into the management of the cats, as I've mentioned um, a few times, we try and um, manage the cats with as little disturbance as possible. And we have a slightly different approach to the way we manage them in the breeding enclosures compared to the pre-release enclosures. In the breeding enclosures, we have to carry out animal introductions because we're breeding the cats. So sometimes we manage the male and female separately. And then towards the end of the year, we start to introduce the male and female for the breeding season. And if successful, they then have kittens, and at some point we have to separate the male and female, and then separate the male, female, and kittens so that we can give the kittens their vaccinations and give them a health assessment. So actually, the, the breeding enclosures, they're actually smaller than the pre-release enclosures, um, but they give us a lot more flexibility in being able to separate animals and hold them for short periods apart. And that's really important because uh, the type of management that we have with those cats in the breeding enclosures is quite different to those in the, the pre-release enclosures. Um, once we move the kittens over to the pre-release enclosures, we essentially manage them like wild animals. We don't lock them away anywhere. We give them vast open natural spaces, and that's really to help them develop their skills before release. Um, so we do have a little bit more contact with the animals in the breeding enclosures before we move them. Um, and then the whole time we're trying to maintain as high standards of animal husbandry and care as possible. Um, we are trying to develop techniques where we use remote devices to weigh the animals or feed the animals. And then we're always exploring um, novel ways to provide um, stimulus to the cats, whether it's through feeding boxes or um, toys that we, we give them, all, all at the same time trying to promote their natural behaviours. And we're very fortunate that we have a, an expert advisory group that we work uh, very closely with. And, and that's some um, of Europe and, and global experts on cat conservation and, and carnivore behavioral development. Um, and that really gives us a lot of confidence that the approach that we're taking is, is the best possible. Now, just to give you an overview of the cycle of um, uh, 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 the breeding um, a cycle of, of the wildcats that we have in the centre. If you start off at the bottom of the screen in uh, October to, to January, well, that's the time of year, the year where we're looking to the breeding se uh, season and we're, we're starting to um, see if there's uh, new animals that we need to bring in or if, uh, if there's animals that we need to move around in the breeding centre before we, we introduce males and females together. Um, when we get to January, um, that's the start of the breeding season, and that's the time that we we slowly um, monitor the behaviour of the male and female when they're separated. 
And if they're behaving and they're showing the right signs, then we introduce them together. And they'll stay together for about two to three months. And using the CCTV cameras, we can monitor any mating that takes place. If there has been matings, um, then the females will, will typically, typically give birth between April and July. Um, and then once they've given birth, uh, we don't interfere with the, with the cats um, when they're a young age. And the first time that we do a health assessment is eight weeks after birth. We give them their first vaccinations and first health check, check what sex they are. Um, and then four weeks after that, we repeat the vaccinations. We give them their booster, carry out some more health assessments, and then we don't touch them again for several months. However, as we get to the end of the year, um, we then start um, making the preparations to move those cats over into the pre-release enclosures where they'll stay until we move closer to the re release period. And then the adult cats will go back into that cycle of introductions and breeding again for the next year. Once we have the cats in the pre-release enclosures, that's when we carry out our CCTV behavioral observations. Um, and then we use the information and the data that we collect to work through a pre-release checklist so that we can evidence that our cats are suitable for release. Um, and that starts to take us towards the end of spring, early summer, which is close to the period of, of release. Um, and this is when we then start to carry out final health assessments of the cats, fit them with a GPS collar, carry out some final observations, and then get them ready for transfer to soft release. Um, and then obviously after a short period, release into the wild. And you'll hear more about the soft release um, side of the project when Kerry gives a, an overview of the, the in-situ work. So that's just a, a very simple uh, representation of the, the reproductive cycle um, and movement of the cats in the, the breeding center. Now, with regards to some of the behaviors that we see, um, I thought you would, be, you would quite enjoy seeing uh, one of our females in the first breeding season um, indicating to the male who was next door when they were separated that she was um, ready for breeding. Um, we look out for these um, uh, unique behaviours, uh, flirt flirting behaviours between the males and females. And when we start to see behaviours like this, we know that the female at least is, is advertising to the male. And the male came over the, to the fence um, in a very um, neutral and friendly way. Um, so after a behavior like that, we will then um, introduce the cats. And the gestation for, for wild cats is around 63 to 65 days. Um, we also carry out some scent swapping. So we'll put the scent of the female um, into the male's enclosure and the scent of the male into the females before we introduce them, just to make um, it as comfortable as possible for those cats. Once we've had them together for a while, and if we, we've observed mating, then our keepers without disturbing the cats, keep a very close eye out on any physical changes in the cats. And we start to see these signs quite close to the time of birth. Um, maybe just one or two weeks prior to birth, we'll see a significant change in size. We'll maybe see nipples on the female start to um, start to grow and we'll know that the females are, are close to birth. When we get to that point, um, the females, if they are pregnant and close to birth, we the, the, the best sign that we'll look out for is not seeing the female for a couple of days. What they will tend to do is they will tend to retire into one of the nest boxes. And after that two days, she'll cook for food. And then maybe about three to four weeks later, we will see bundles of fur falling out of the nest box and going for their first walk with their mother. Um, and of course, these are, these are always um, very exciting uh, times for our keepers um, and our all of our project staff to see new births in the center um and it's always uh, it's always a bit of a guessing game as to how many youngsters um are going to come out of the nest box in the end um and obviously now that we have our cctv system we can keep a very close eye on the development of those youngsters and the parents um, and monitor that closely as we move ahead so just to give you an overview of, of the reproductive success we've had um, over the last couple of years, this was year one. This was our first breeding year in 2022. Um, our, our target each year is to produce 20 offspring for release. And in year one, we were um, we surpassed that by um, having 22 kittens. Unfortunately, one of those kittens died. Um, and so the, the surviving was 21 out of 22, but that was still 
uh, a very uh, high survival of 95%. And then this year, or last year rather, in 2023, it was our second breeding season. Um, and again, we had three quarters of our, our uh, breeding pairs reproduce. Um, and in 2023, we had 14 kittens. And unfortunately, one of those kittens died at a young age, giving us a survival of 93%. Um, so quite a successful start to the, the breeding of, of the cats um, in the center. Now, as I mentioned, the, the management style of uh, our pre-release enclosures compared to the uh, breeding enclosures is quite different. We, we have um, a lot less uh, activity around the pre-release enclosures. Our keepers only go out there to feed and do um, semi-regular cleans so that the area is nice and quiet. Um, the enclosures are much larger where purposely we, we try not to see the cat um, as often um, as we may do in the breeding centre. And again, all of this is just to try and promote the natural behaviours. And these are just some videos to give you an example of the observations that we get from our, our CCTV cameras. Um, when we move the cats from the breeding enclosures into the pre-release enclosures, we place them in these old whiskey barrels and we block the hole up and then we remove the straw late in the day and allow the cats to come out in their own time, knowing that we can observe uh, the cats' movements um, on CCTV and record it all. But we found that this way really removes the flight response from the cats, gives a control to the cats of when they want to come out into the enclosure and really has a positive effect on, on the cats settling in to the new enclosures. We also see a lot of behavior like this grooming behavior between females, which is um, always just a positive sign when we manage um, animals together on, on the rare occasion that we do. And then down in the bottom left, uh, we also see some behaviors where our cats are looking for food. They're trying to find things. They can maybe smell a mouse and they're, they're following the scent trail and they're conducting these really natural behaviors, exploratory behaviors across the enclosure. And then when we, we, we obviously still um, have to feed our cats, we can't give them anything live, but we try and give them as natural a diet as possible and present it in a way where we're, go we're going to promote some of the behavior. So of course, uh, this cat has not caught that rabbit, it was fed it, but it's still possessing and using some of those natural behaviors um, to push and pull at the, at the food. Um, and just another feeding technique we use, which is to emulate some of the um, wild behaviors is that of feeding large carcasses, um, something that wild cats will, will do in the wild. Um, so we, we place some of the uh, large deer carcasses in the enclosure and allow the cats to come back to them over a period of um, a, a few weeks, particularly in the, in the colder winter months. And once we've carried out the, the uh, data collection from the cameras, we use this to generate graphs and, and look at trends and evaluate each of the cat's behaviors over, over a period of time. And that then helps us inform some of the decisions as to whether those cats are suitable for release and answer some of those key questions that we have um, on the pre-release um, checklist. And yep, I think that is my last slide. Um, so sorry for that sort of, fast whistle stop tour of all things ex situ, um, but Kerry has a, a lot of um, uh, exciting updates from the in situ uh, side of things. And, and like I said, she'll touch on the more of the details around the collaring and soft release. So I'll pass over to Kerry now. Thank you. Thanks, David. Okay, hi everyone. My name's Kerry Langridge. I'm the in situ manager for Saving Wildcats. And the in situ part is everything outside of the zoo. So in situ is uh, essentially where the cats are supposed to be. Um, although always it's quite confusing for everyone to know the difference between in situ and ex situ. Um, my background is in research science. I'm a behavioral ecologist, uh, but I've worked with wildcats in Scotland for the last nine years. And I was a project officer on the previous project, Scottish Wildcat Action. Um, so I've been working in the wild with, with uh, wildcats in Scotland for, for quite a while now. And this has been a very exciting step for me and for the rest of the in-situ team. Um, so in-situ management for Saving Wildcats, the aims and objectives for us were to assess the release site, which involves a lot of pre-release ecological surveys and social surveys, to prepare the release site, to identify the threats and mitigate them, and then to monitor the release. 
uh, including post-release surveys and obviously tracking of the release wildcats. I'm not going to dwell much on the initial phases today, the assessments and the preparatory side, because we've done quite a few previous talks on those subjects, and I'm sure everybody is keen to know what's happened after the release. So I'll skip through some of the preparatory work, uh, but it was two and a half years worth of work, so it's quite a lot of work to skip through. Um, so in terms of the institute management, a key part obviously is the release site. Um, the release site itself is known as Cairngorms Connect. Uh, it is around 200 square kilometers of suitable habitat. Cairngorms Connect itself is around 650 uh, square kilometers but a lot of that habitat is, is very high ground and that's not suitable for wildcats. So the map here illustrates the red boundary is Cairngorms Connect. It's within the Cairngorms National Park uh, and the green illustrates the suitable habitat. So the sort of contiguous suitable habitat across that area. Uh, so Cairngorms Connect was identified as that release site, uh, partly because it has a lot of European protected sites in it, uh, which were previously known as Natura sites before Brexit. Um, and because we're funded by EU Life, uh, our release site had to have European protected sites within it, and this one has a lot of them. Cairngorms Connect has uh, long-term management plans of its own uh, with conservation aims. So it's a, a good site for us to release wildcats because it is an area where the focus is on conservation uh, in the long term. So uh, ongoing surveys in Cairngorms Connect. So it's also a very well surveyed area. There's been people working in there for many years and doing surveys and the, the initial surveys suggested there were very few domestic cats um, and there were very good small mammal populations. So the ecological uh, survey suggested that it might be a good release site. So the preparatory work for the Institute team from 2020 to 2023 all of it revolved around the Scottish Code for Conservation Translocation. So what we had to do was prepare the evidence to be able to apply for a translocation license, which is what you need in Scotland to be able to uh, release the species like wildcat. I'm not going to go through all of this because there's a lot of work, uh, but it included things like uh, a habitats regulations appraisal. So this is a very uh, long document. It's a process whereby we assess whether we are going to have an ecological impact on existing habitats or protected species. We have to get licenses, for example, for trap new to release and to release the wildcats themselves. The translocation license application itself required baseline ecological surveys, uh, which were done every year genetic risk assessments, disease risk assessments, stakeholder engagement, a release strategy, a full post-release monitoring plan, and many, many other documents. Uh, so this was a very big piece of work for us that the whole team contributed to for several years, but it culminated in us being granted the translocation license in January last year. Uh, and another key part of, for us, as well as um, the surveys, is uh, reducing the threats. So as Helen has already mentioned, one of the key threats being hybridization uh, to wildcats. Uh, we monitor the wild living cats in the project area. We have done that since 2020. We run responsible cat ownership campaigns. We run a program of trap, neuter, vaccinate, return for feral domestic cats and hybrid cats. Uh, we have a disease screening program. And we have a long uh, and very effective collaboration, both with the Strathspey branch of Cats Protection and with Strathspey Vets. So we collaborate with them also on trap, neuter, vaccinate, release, so that we can be more effective over a wider area. And another major threat to wildcats remains uh, predator control. So wildcats can be confused with feral domestic cats and hybrids, obviously, both of which are legally controlled by gamekeepers in Scotland. Um, to try and address that risk, uh, we had a facilitated workshop with gamekeepers from across the National Park in March 2023. And uh, partly because wildcats might predate game birds and they might target pheasant pens. That was one of our initial concerns. So we facilitated a workshop to get together with gamekeepers and work out what some of the problems might be and how we might be able to mitigate some of those things in advance. One of them was identified as being a problem with wildcat identification and that the current guidance was quite difficult to interpret. So we came up with new guidance that was much simpler uh, and we've developed a communication strategy with the estates to keep them updated as to the locations of the wildcats. So let's get on to some of the uh, interesting bits. So the release strategy. Um, we had to come up with a release strategy, and we did that by consulting a lot of experts uh, from across the world who've done this before on various other projects. Um, 
this is the strategy that we came up with after consultation with all of these uh, wider uh, different projects and experts. Um, we decided to do soft release. It's also known as delayed release, uh, as opposed to hard release, which is where you put the animal in a cage, you take it out there and you open the door. Uh, we went with soft release uh, for several reasons, um, partly because it's been shown to increase site fidelity uh, of animals once they're released, particularly mammals. So uh, the idea of soft release is that you put them into an enclosure in the field site, and then the animal has the chance to get used to the sights and sounds and smells of that new location. And so the initial stress involved with trapping that animal, moving it, has a chance to decrease so that the animal is calmer once you release it. And you can re reduce the risk of it just immediately fleeing the area. We decided to release them between June and September um, because this coincides with peak prey availability. Uh, it was for a variety of reasons as well. It meant that the kittens were a good age. Um, we released them in small groups of familiar individuals. We released them when they were between 12 and 16 months old. And there's a few reasons for that. It means they're sort of the natural dispersal age, uh, but part of it logistically was around uh, putting GPS collars on because they have to be at least a year old to put those collars on so that the animal isn't growing anymore, obviously. Uh, we provided supplementary food and water. Uh, wildcats were collared and health checked a few weeks prior to their release. That allowed us to put collars on and then watch them in the pre-release enclosures and see how the cats responded to that. They were held in the soft release enclosures for between three and seven days. They were checked by the wildcat keepers daily and they were monitored 24 seven by remote CCTV whilst they were in these enclosures. So that was our strategy for how we were going to release uh, the 19 wildcats uh, over the summer. So before we could release them, we had to put GPS collars on and we had to health screen them. Uh, so we do that with our veterinary team. We have a dedicated project vet, Alice, um, and then uh, a team of other vets and vet nurses at the park. So the collars themselves are GPS collars, but they're radio GPS collars. So you can see some of them to the right there. Um, the collars are widely used across Europe. They're sort of tried and tested technology, which is what we wanted. We wanted reliability. The last thing we wanted was to release the wildcats and then the collars don't work. So these are tried and tested. They've been used across Europe for a long, long time uh, on many different projects with wildcats. We've also used them ourselves. Our previous project collared hybrid wildcats in Scotland with these collars. So they were tried and tested and these, this is a technology we decided to go with. Um, people have do ask frequently why we're not using satellite collars in the sense of the same kind of tags that birds of prey have, uh, whereby you can sit at the computer and the GPS data gets downloaded to you automatically. That kind of technology is not available for this size of mammal. Those, it, it comes down to power. So for raptor tags, they're powered by solar panels, but we are talking about a nocturnal species that lives in a hole. So solar panels don't work. So you have to use a battery. And the size of the battery is what restricts that technology. So you can see on the, the photo here of the collar, the big round thing with the high vis tape on it, that's the battery. That's the heaviest bit. The other little bit is the, uh, the GPS tracker itself. So the collars themselves are made of silicon. Um, they weigh 2% uh, of wildcat body weight. Uh, in collaring the, and tagging generally, the weight guidance is that they should be between three and 5% of the animal's body weight. So we're at 2%, so we're way below recommended welfare guidance for uh, collaring. So we, uh, with the help of David's team, the, the keepers uh, trapped the wildcats several weeks before we planned to release them. They took blood samples and tested them, screened them for disease. They checked them for any other health concerns. Um, and then if the cats were clear, then we put the collars on. Um, you can see, that the vet is holding up an extra piece there on the edge of the collar. People sometimes ask us why we haven't cut that piece off. Well, we actually have trimmed the collars down already. The reason we can't cut that piece off is because there's an aerial in it. Um, collars obviously always, if they're radio collars, they have an aerial sticking out. These are internal aerials. So we cut it off as close as we can to where the aerial ends, but we can't cut all of it off because it wouldn't transmit any, any uh, data. And the reason for the high-vis tape is something that was suggested in the Gamekeeper workshop 
uh, which was during this transition phase where people are learning how to identify wildcats to make them as identifiable as possible. So we agreed to try putting high vis tape on the collars and actually it has worked pretty well and it has stayed on so far for a quite a long time. Um, so that has been quite effective. We also thought it might help with road risk potentially. So for soft release, uh, we had to build soft release enclosures. Uh, so David and I went out into the field and we, with all the work of the field team over the previous two and a half years, we identified locations where we could build soft release pens and they're not easy to find. Uh, we had to find places that were accessible so we could get there and bring all the bits. As you can see, these are very big things that are very heavy. They need to be accessible, but they equally, we don't want them to be found by members of the public. So it was quite hard to find locations that uh, meet both of those criteria, uh, but we did manage to find some places. Um, and we had a huge amount of help in building them from all of the project partners and from local volunteers. Um, and in the end, we built 13 of these at several different locations across the site. And this is one of the sites with uh, the soft release enclosures. And we had several enclosures at each site so that cats could be released in groups uh, together. Um, you might be able to see, now you, uh, can you? There's a camera on a tree uh, in the left of that picture. So we were trying new technology uh, that hadn't been used for this purpose before. So we have uh, remote rear link cameras uh, that allowed us to monitor the pens 24 seven. Uh, so basically so that we could see whether there was any disturbance from the public um, or from dogs or from any other disturbance effects. Um, and actually across the whole release period, we didn't have any uh, any members of the public actually finding the pens. Uh, so there was no disturbance, but the cameras actually turned out to be very useful for monitoring the cats while they were in the enclosures. This is one of the images that we get on our phone uh, from these. So you can see one of the cats sitting in the pens uh, while it was waiting to be released. And then we did everything we could, everything we could think of to try and anchor the cats to the site. One of the things you want with these kind of release projects is you want site fidelity. You want your release animals to stay where you put them. That's why you put them there. And often these projects fail because you release the animals and they all just disperse across a wider environment. So we did everything we could think of to increase site fidelity. Soft release was one of those things. Supplementary feeding is another. And a third was that we had access to lots and lots of wildcat scat because we had them in an enclosure, obviously. So the wildcat keepers collected a lot of scat for us from all the individual cats. And the night before we released them, we went out and made fake latrines of the cats all around the sites so that when we released them, there was some familiar scent for them. So perhaps help reduce the panic response where they would just run. And this is the first wildcat uh, that had been in Strats Bay probably for the last seven or eight years or so at least. Um, this is the first one that was released. She left on the 12th of June at 6.36 in the morning, and we were all very excited watching this in Helen's kitchen. Um, and yeah, this, this was the first one. This is one of, I think this has been the, that was the most exciting bit so far of the project for all of us was, uh, so David and Alice and I went out, uh, we opened the doors on the enclosures at four in the morning and that was it. We just opened the door and then we walked away and then drove away. And then we watched these remotely on the cameras. Um, and the cats would usually come and sit at the door and then they would leave sort of quietly a couple of hours later after having to look around for a while. And this is one of the videos I'm gonna, let's hope this plays. I know sometimes they're juddery. Um, but this was a similar, you can see the time is 20 past six. It was usually about two hours after we opened the door that the cats would leave. So the reason we put those doors high up is because we wanted to be able to supplementary feed without uh, other animals taking the bait. And obviously uh, there's a lot of badgers, pine martens, foxes, everything else. So, and that also worked quite well, allowed us to supplementary feed and allowed the cats to come and go. So to summarize, 19 wildcats were released between June the 12th and September can't see that under this thing. September the 8th, yeah, September the 8th was the last one. Three of them weren't released because there were 22 originally. So three weren't released. Um, one of them had a significant health issue and that one eventually was euthanized, unfortunately. Um, and the other two, they didn't meet the 
body condition score that we required to be able to release them. So they will probably be part of the release cohort for next year. Uh, but 19 of them were released. That was 11 females and eight males. They were released at four different sites. Uh, we monitored them all with remote cameras. And the tracking began at 9 a.m. on day one, on the 12th of June. And the tracking was then seven days a week. So post-release monitoring. The post-release monitoring of the cats is clearly very, very important. You need to monitor them post-release because otherwise, how can you say whether anything you did was successful or not? We can't just release the cats and say, we've released them, it was a success. We need to know what happened and whether they survived. So that requires a pretty comprehensive program of, of post-release monitoring. The most important tool for us is the radio GPS tracking. Uh, but we also have an extensive network of camera traps. We rely on sightings information. We collect scat and we analyze it for diet. And we also will be trapping the cats at various points uh, to recollar them or take the collars off. So here's an example of some of the field team tracking. We've had huge numbers of uh, volunteers helping us with this, uh, but it's basically, it's mainly the field team. It's my full-time staff of four uh, field officers who were out every single day. Um, for the past seven months uh, tracking these cats. This slide illustrates the sort of data that we get back. This is old, this is from the end of the summer. The cats aren't here in these locations anymore, but this is the sort of, this is to illustrate the sort of data that we get. So you can see this is them spread across the Cairngorms Connect area, basically. In terms of ecology, the things that we've learned so far, they're showing the kind of habitat use that we would predict. They're using edge habitats, mainly rough grassland, scrub, mixed woodland, and broadleaf woodland. They don't like the coniferous forest. It's not preferred, although they do use the clear fell areas for hunting, and they like the wind throw uh, as cover. Camera traps have recorded hunting uh, of the cats of a variety of different species, including small mammals and rabbits. And we've had some very interesting stuff recently, uh, brown hares. Uh, we've had a hare up a tree, uh, like a leopard would do. Um, so the ecology of the cats, we're learning a lot, we're learning every day. Uh, here's a video of one of them hunting. This was quite early on. I'm not sure it class that's hunting, it's just playing really. <laughs> and she plays with that vol for about an hour and a half. It gets quite sad in the end. Um, but they, they are all showing this kind of behavior. So we were very pleased to see this, obviously this was a concern, uh, you know, that they will hunt for themselves. Um, but they have all proven that they are able to do that. Um, we were also very pleased with, uh, the fact that they use the latrines. That's quite a long video. So that obviously is, that's very useful for us. If we, we can get them to come to a particular location, then we can use that to monitor them. And we don't know if it helped with site fidelity or not, but it, it, it certainly didn't harm it. It seems to have been positive. So there's some challenges with this, obviously. Uh, the tracking is very, very resource intensive. Uh, supportive management is also resource intensive. I'll explain what that is in just a second. Managing hyperdispersal has been very difficult, and we've had issues with predation, as you might expect, because we have released a predator. So supportive management uh, it includes things like supplementary feeding. Uh, so the, some of the cats did use supplementary food. Most of them didn't, uh, but we continue to provide the supplementary food as long as they needed it for. Uh, we monitor the behavior of the cats daily. So we go out and track the cats still. Uh, we're down now to five days a week, but pretty much as much as possible. Uh, we try to get all of their data daily, and then we look at the data, and we try to assess whether the cat is okay or whether there is some issue that we need to go out and manage. So, for example, this is one of the cats, uh, Fiddick. You can see these are his daily distances move. So he was pretty active. He was moving a lot. Suddenly, he stops moving for three days. So... We're obviously concerned about that. We go out and monitor him, uh, we try to see him in the field. 
uh, what we ended up doing was putting cameras up and providing food for him. So we fed him for a couple of weeks or so. We watched his activity gradually pick up again, and then he was okay. We didn't have to feed him anymore. We're not sure what happened. Um, he could have been attacked by something. He could have got a fright. He could have got injured somehow. Um, but the idea of doing this is to find out if he was injured and therefore whether we needed to do something and intervene. But in that instance, and in, in the others we've monitored so far, there hasn't been a need to intervene further than that. Another example is, so this is the sort of GPS data that we get. You can see all the points are in the same place. So we look at these and we know, okay, well, the cat hasn't moved. So is there a problem? Uh, is the collar stuck on something? So we go out and investigate. What we did find, which was very interesting, is that a lot of the time when we were seeing this, it's because the cats were sitting on a deer carcass and guarding the carcass and feeding on it. Um, so that was something that we, we hadn't documented in Scotland before with Scottish wildcats. Oh, yeah, there's the deer carcass, quite hard to see. Uh, and finally, hyperdispersal. So you probably will have seen this uh, because it was in the news, but uh, this is one of the cats, uh, this one here. Um, so this is the sort of distances they moved from the release pen. So this is all the individuals. So broadly speaking, most of them didn't move very far from the release pens. Um, the dispersal was fairly low and the site fidelity was very high so we actually have very good success with site fidelity uh most of the cats have stayed in the area a couple of them didn't uh one was this one um that we call willie uh and that's him in his soft release pen he was the last wildcat to be released uh in september so he was released in the southern area of cairngorms connect and within a couple of days, we couldn't find him. We couldn't find him at all. We searched for him for a week, couldn't find anything. My team were going up every mountain and hill that we could get up. Um, and then after a week, one of the team managed to download his data and they were stood up here on Mila Buckle and the cat turned out to be there uh, on Skorgui. And I managed to download his data from a straight line distance of about 12 kilometers away, which is quite a long way. We can't normally download it from that far. Uh, so we got his data and we looked at where he was and he was here. He was on the very top of school GUI on this ledge. And we were quite worried about him because there's nothing to eat up there. And it didn't seem like a very good place for him to be. So we went out the next day to keep trying to find him. We couldn't find him. Uh, we searched for two weeks. We searched everywhere. Uh, the weather was horrible, so that didn't help. Uh, and eventually myself and my colleague, uh, Kerry Kilshaw, we decided he must have gone over the plateau. He must be in Mar Lodge. So we contacted the staff at Mar Lodge, uh, one of whom uh, has worked with Wildcats previously, well, both of them actually. Um, we asked them where they thought he might be if he was on Mar Lodge and they gave us some hints. So we drove over there um, and found him after two weeks. Um, and he had done this. Um, he had gone down the edge of Skorgui, and this is like a sheer cliff. He'd walked straight down, straight to the lock, and then he'd gone over the plateau here. He'd gone up Ben McDewey, which is the second highest mountain uh, in Scotland. And then he'd gone all around here and he'd ended up on Mar Lodge. He, he's not there anymore. He was there for a couple of months, uh, but he has moved on now. But he's our biggest hyper disperser so far. He obviously presents us with a lot of challenges because that's a long way from Strasbourg. So collecting his data is proving uh, difficult for us. And the, finally, one of the big challenges for us is human wildlife conflict. And the main issues with that have been predation of uh, backyard chickens, particularly when they're in the forest or right next to the forest. Um, and then the pheasants that are released by sporting estates, the cats have predated those as well. Both of these things are a concentrated and very easily accessible food source for a cat. We're coming, we're writing a mitigation plan at present with recommendations for prevention of these things and how we deal with them. Uh, we're running another gamekeeper workshop as well in March uh, to have a follow up with gamekeepers around predation of pheasants. So what next? We continue tracking all the released wildcats. Uh, so what I haven't said so far is that this mortality has been very low. So, so far, actually, we've done very well on site fidelity and mortality. So we've only had one. Uh, one cat die and it was uh, an older female so actually of the kittens uh, the younger captive bred cats as of uh, a couple of days ago when we last got all their data they're all still alive and that's seven months on now from the first release so what we thought 
particularly road mortality so far, touch wood, we haven't had any examples of that. We continue camera trap monitoring the release site. We have over 100 cameras out. Uh, they're out all the time. We have targeted camera trap monitoring of all the individual wildcats because we're obviously now monitoring them for re reproduction. We are trapping to recolor them and give them a health check. Uh, we are starting that now. And we're hoping to do the first ones next week because the collar batteries are starting to die. We are still obviously working on threat mitigation across the wider area. Uh, threats like hybridization and persecution have not gone away and continuing stakeholder engagement and supportive management of the cats. And we're planning for the next releases uh, this summer. And that's all of my talk. Uh, so I will stop sharing. And I think Helena just has the thank yous. Thanks, Kerry. Um, just to say that the Saving Wildcats project wouldn't be possible without our project partners and all of our multiple funders um, and all of you. Uh, we wouldn't be in this position without significant support from a variety of different organisations, and we are incredibly thankful for all of their generous support.